Yeah, so uh, so Paul is actually a second year PhD student, so it's like a baton du feu, as we say. Um, so yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm going to present some work uh, we've been doing uh, last year and uh, uh, some new developments this year on uh, estimation of densities for objects that are near or on a manifold, for data that are near or on a manifold. So that's the idea. And the, so why uh, would you why would why would you like to do that? Well, typically it's because you sort of uh, you are in high dimension. So in our case, high dimensions is going to be three in our examples. But um, mm -hmm. imagine it. <laughs> and so uh, so you have uh, objects point that observations that are supposedly in high dimensions, but uh, you expect them to live in uh, something that has a much smaller dimension. So like, for instance, here you have the data points that are on this, that are these crosses here. Uh, and but so so what what you can sort of imagine is that these of this data sort of live along a curve or close to a curve. So here, uh, so this you have this sort of uh, little cloud here. Uh, and I'm, I'm assuming I'm going to assume that the data are, are in the cloud. So that's one way of thinking about data being driven by something which is low dimensional here. So it's on a cloud, so it's not exactly on the manifold, but it's close to the manifold. So here the manifold would be the, the black line. And my, my points are on this sort of blue area, shaded area near the, near, near the black line. Uh, but you can also have uh, cases where the, you can, it's a good uh, way of, uh, uh, where it's reasonable to think that the data live on the manifold. So in this case, they would live on the, bla on the black line. And so this is like, this is a typical example that we would talk about, and I can't exactly remember the details, but you have these molecules and, and you, uh, your observations are all the, conf the conformations of these molecules. So they are like high dimensional, something like 70 dimensions or something like that. But uh, physical uh, uh, notions tell you that uh, actually they live on this three dimensional manifold. It's not quite a manifold, but it's something like a manifold. So, um, so these all these sort of notions are often thought about manifold manifold hypothesis so because the idea behind is that you want to reduce the dimension one way or the other so the sort of the way, first way of thinking about dimension reduction is to think about linear dimension reduction like for instance pca when you project on subspaces but uh, but the manifold story is when you don't want it to be linear so you're thinking that instead of being a subspace that you want to think about it it's more like a curve or something like that and so these so they fall within the sort of notions of Nonlinear dimension reduction, and that's where we are. And so, either you are on a manifold, or you, you are close to a manifold. And a typical of the example of thinking that you are close to manifold is because you're thinking that there is a signal that's actually on the manifold, but the signal has some noise, and so the, and the noise is small, so you are close to a manifold. So that's the signal, and that's the noise. But yeah. Uh, so what are the challenges there? So if you think that the observations are on the manifold, then, and the manifold is unknown, then you are in this sort of non-dominating model because uh, the support of your data can be anywhere. And it's like, it's a singular, like it's a sort of degenerate object compared to the whole support RD. Um, uh, and so this is a non-dominating model. And so then the first thing that you can think of is, okay, I'm going to use, uh, a model on distributions because it's not dominated. And the first idea is to use the Richelet process. So talk is going, Paul is going to, to talk about it on uh, the second part. Uh, it's a fairly simple solution, but sometimes it's interesting to model as well the density. So you are thinking that you're, you have observations on a manifold that follows a distribution that has a density and the density lives on this manifold. So it's a density with respect to the uh, Hausdorff measure on the manifolds. Um, and then in this case, what do you do from a Bayesian point of view? Because it's very hard to construct a prior on densities over a support which you don't know. Uh, and so, but this, so this is the second part of the talk. <laughs> now in the first part of the talk, I'm going to talk about something which is easier to think about in a Bayesian context. And it also makes sense from a uh, applied perspective, which is to think that the data live in this sort of uh, uh, tube. So they live close to a manifold. So M delta is the tube, so it's a set of points that are close to the manifold. M is a manifold, and near your heart. and so delta is small. And this manifold M is d-dimensional, so it's like a curve of dimension little t. And the ambient space have a dimension capital D, and capital D is typically large, and little d is not so large, hopefully. 
And you're assuming that the, the observations have some density F on Rd, but uh, that F is concentrating, concentrated on this sort of tube along the manifold. And you don't know M, you don't know delta, you don't know D, and you don't know F. So you know nothing, you know Rd, capital D. And so the point, the aim of the game is that because your, the, your observation live on close to this manifold little d, are you going to suffer the curse of dimensionality associated to capital D, or are you going to suffer the dimensionality little d? And how can you sort of formalize these ideas? And so that's uh, what we have been doing. We have been trying to formalize the idea of a, of a density that lives in sort of this shaded area close to a manifold that, are the, that is a black, black curve. And so you, you, with as little an assumption as possible. So assuming that we have a smooth manifold and this manifold is well behaved, which means that it has a reach. What does it mean that it has a reach? It means that the curvature of the curve is bounded mm -hmm. or it also means that um, uh, it doesn't have a bottleneck. A bottleneck is something like that. But actually in our procedure, we, don't, we, ac we can accept this sort of situation where the manifold has a bottleneck that's okay, but we don't accept something like that. Well, so where, where we have a, like unbounded uh, um, uh, curvature. So now, so to a little drawing. So this is the, the blue line is the manifold and I'm looking at a patch near uh, around the point. So because you have a well-behaved manifold, you can sort of split your manifold or the surroundings of your manifold into these little patches. And so, and on this little patch, I'm going to consider a tangent space. Uh, yeah, let me see here. So you have a tangent space in that direction, and this is a normal space here. Okay, and uh, the so now I have have a density that lives on this uh, yellow area, and I want to mo model the fact that this density is going to have a smoothness. Uh, along the curve, a certain smoothness along the curves and a different smoothness normal to the curve. So, um, so, and the curve of course, so it's a bit like a smoothness is, and the, so the, the smoothness is going to be anisotropic, but the anisotropy is going to be evolving along the curve. So it's not like linear anisotrope uh, smoothness. So how do you formalize that? So when you have a well-behaved manifold like we have, we are assuming, assume, assuming, assuming, assume, assuming uh, you can find a parameterization of a point. So this is the tube that I was drawing here. So this is a point uh, uh, in this tube I was talking about. And I, and I can construct a parameterization of a point like that into a Euclidean space of dimension capital D, where uh, this, this line represents a tangent space along the manifold here. And this blue black line represents the, the normal space in a, a, a normal to my manifold. And so there is this, so, so this tr transformation is sidebar. So it's a, it's a well-behaved transformation. If my, if my manifold is smooth, sidebar is smooth. So it's a well-behaved transformation of, an, of, a, of a point here into a point there and, or vice versa. And now I'm going to, uh, writes f in terms of the, co the coordinates on, on, this, uh, on this transformation. So f of psi bar of v, and because I'm living into this little, uh, uh, I'm living into a, a, a little uh, tube of size delta, and, I, and so the density is very concentrated, and because it's very concentrated, it's, ex it's exploding. What I want to model is essentially the density rescaled. So as if I was living on a, on a tube of size one. And so this is the rescaling I'm talking about there. And so now this, then this version is, you can think about it as a sort of a um, reparameterized density uh, and rescaled by this delta factor. Uh, and so now what I'm going to assume is that this F bar delta has linear anisotrope uh, smoothness. So the usual linear uh, anisotrope smoothness, in other words, locally, it has a smoothness beta naught along uh, this axis and the smoothness beta per say along that axis. So it's, it's a, the sort of the usual uh, anisotropy smoothness that you, people find in the literature. It's except that what we're asking, we also have having some constraint on the cross derivatives. You know, the words, what we want is having Taylor expansions. So, you, so you're having a smoothness, holder type of smoothness, so that you have Taylor expansions of this function F bar delta. 
So, why, so it's it, well, think about it as you have you you're thinking of the parameterization of f, but onto the sort of uh, Euclidean space, which is a local parameterization. It's a bit like in physics. In physics, you know, I, mean, I don't know if you remember physics when you were undergrads, but in physics, uh, when uh, you are following uh, uh, an object, uh, you you were looking at the of the local uh, uh, parameterization of your of your point in your in the space, and that, that was following the sort of the trajectory of the of the of the object, and that's exactly the same here. That's the same notion. Okay, and so so. Is it uh, so? It seems like it's something created, and it maybe it means nothing. But actually, it doesn't mean nothing, like uh, because uh, sort of the examples that we find in the literature of observation that live close to manifold fall into this framework. In other words, uh, the typical example that you find is are uh, uh, when the observations are a signal plus some noise, which has size uh, delta. Uh, and so you have two types of uh, examples in the literature: when when the noise uh, epsilon here is a uh, normal to the manifold so for it at each point you have you add some no, noise normal to the manifold and the observation here so the signal is on the manifold so that's one type of example it's not the most natural one the most natural one is when you think when you have some isotropic noise so you're adding some like gaussian noise for instance or, or well it's supposed to be compact but, or, but you can accept gaussian it works as well and so you have a smooth noise and uh, what you're observing is a perturbative version and all these examples satisfy the assumption, sort of the smoothness uh, assumptions that we're considering. If the manifold has a smoothness which is larger than the smoothness of the density on the manifold, so F star has density has smoothness beta naught, and the smoothness of your manifold beta m is larger than beta naught. And then in this case, so the, so this, these are typical examples of uh, what we're considering. So you can think about them as sort of the driving examples to uh, understand what's going on. And so the aim of the game here is not to estimate F star, but it's to estimate the density of the observations. So it's not an inverse problem. Uh, so let me remind you. So you have observation Xi that follow, that belong to uh, the neighborhood, a tube around some unknown manifold. So you don't know the size of the tube. You don't know the manifold. You don't know the dimension of the manifold. And you want to estimate the density f of these observations. You're assuming that there is a density. And you're, you're going to assume that it has some smoothness to be able to say something about the precision of your estimation. So now let's go back to what we know about uh, the density estimation in dimension D, capital D. So if you make no assumptions apart from sort of Hölder beta assumption, beta can be anisotropic, it's sort of the same. Well, let's say beta. Then the rate of the minimax rate of, of convergence for estimating the density in this context is n to the power minus beta over two beta plus d. And so you're paying a high price if capital D is large. That's what we call the, cur the curse of dimensionality. Now, if you know if your observation belongs to a, a manifold capital uh, M, uh, even if you don't know the manifold and you have a, a density f on the manifold, the manifold has dimension little d, f has, has some smoothness, Hölder smoothness beta uh, on the manifold. Then if you're looking at the de density pointwise, so the pointwise rate for estimating f at x for all x is going to be of order n minus beta over two beta plus little d. And so then you are, you are improving your rate because you are living on, an, on a much smaller object. But even though you don't know where you're living, where the observations are, well, you know where the observations are, but where the density live, uh, uh, you, you, can, you can capture a much better rate. Now, uh, so these are, and there are frequentist estimators that achieve such rates. Uh, another uh, rate of interest for us is a case where um, you are an, linear anisotrope. In other words, uh, the density has some smoothness beta naught across along some axes. So uh, for instance, for the first two coordinates and beta per for the last two coordinates or whatever. And then the rate of convergence has is this form. So you have this beta naught over two beta naught plus D. Well, imagine beta naught is larger than beta per. So that along the dimension D that corresponds to beta naught. And then the beta per, a term that corresponds to the uh, like low uh, low uh, low regularity uh, coordinates or high regularity coordinates, sorry. And so, if beta perp is infinite, then you uh, then you get um, this rate of convergence, and you have some kind of gain due to the fact that you have a lot of smoothness for some of the coordinates. 
So now what we want to do is buy an inference. So remember, you want to construct a prior on F, F is on RD, but you know that it actually lives on a very small tube of, of around a, a curve that have a small dimension. But you don't know the cube, you don't know where it is. So you want to construct a prior that's flexible and that's going to be able to accommodate for that. And so the first thing you can think about is to distribute the Dirichlet process mixture of Gaussians because it's the sort of the first thing that you can think about. So indeed, so you, uh, if you look at a, a, a mixture of normal as a non-parametric prior for density estimation, so you can look at location scale or location mixture of normals. So here, this is a location scale mixture of normals. So if P is a, follows the Dirichlet process, it's a Dirichlet process mixture of normals, but it doesn't have to be a Dirichlet process. Now, what's going to happen is that the choice of the prior on P is going to be crucial. So there are, there are lots of results on the Dirichlet process mixture of normals and lots of results on rates of convergence for Bayesian procedures based on those guys. And the first, uh, if you take a lo location scale mixture, so as it is written here, then there are the, the Blasi and co-authors have, have obtained some rates of estimation if you assume that F has smoothness beta uh, on RD. Uh, and the rates that they obtain are suboptimal. And they've been trying very hard, so it's not, uh, and it's not clear whether it's impossible to get good rates with these objects or whether it's just we just can't get them anyway. Um, and now, so, so we don't know what to do with them in a sense. If, on the other hand, if you take a smaller, a simpler version, which is a location mixture, which essentially boils down to considering f of the form uh, phi sigma of x minus mu dp of mu. So sigma is, a, you have the same variance for every component in your mixture. Uh, in this case, you can get the, the minimax rate of estimation. So the, even though it's less, it's a less flexible prior, it gives you better rates. At last, at least you can prove that you can, the, the rate that you obtain are better than the way, the one you obtain for the, with the other prior. Um, but it's not very flexible because it's very uh, rigid. You have the same sigma for every, for every uh, component. So. Um, there, are, there are some results with a hybrid version, and I'm going to discuss that a, a bit further, but somehow that's the way to go. What we want is something flexible because we don't definitely don't want to have sigma the same everywhere because of this sort of uh, um, manifold, which is non-linear. But uh, we don't want to be too flexible because we know that with location scan mixture, there is not, not much we can say. So do we have two propositions? And I'm going to describe essentially the first one. If you're interested in the second, I'll talk about the second afterwards. So the first proposition, which is a, a, a partial location scale mixture, where you, so you're accepting sigma to move, so to change from one component to, the, to, to know another, but you're forcing the eigenvalues of sigma, of your covariance, to be the same for every component. So what, the only thing that you're accepting to move between components is the orientation of your covariance. So you have an, a, a different orientation for each of the covariance matrices. So here, uh, so, so you have the same, uh, same lambda for every component, but the orientation, so O is a ortho, it's an orthogonal, norm, orthogonal matrix, the O changing from, for, for each component. So this is our prior. And now what can we say for this prior? So actually, what, what what we say is amazing. It's very simple. Uh, is that so? You have if you have a density f not, f not lives close uh, to your manifold, so it lives on this m delta uh, tube. Uh, m is unknown. I remember delta is unknown, and you assume that f not has this sort of anisotropic uh, Helder manifold anisotropic smoothness that I was talking about. So it has beta not smoothness along the manifold. And it has beta perp smoothness normal to the manifold with beta perp larger than beta naught. So the, the less smooth version is along the manifold. And it, it has this sort of usual uh, tell, tell assumptions. Then the posterior contraction rate for in L1 for estimating F naught is this epsilon n, which has two terms, two parts. So it's the maximum of two things. The first thing is what you obtain for anisotropic uh, densities when the anisotropy is known and is on the axis, along the axis. So here, essentially, you can think about this problem as an extension to uh, anisotropic densities, uh, but the anisotropy is moving on the space. And also, it's because it's, and it's also an extension to the fact that your density has not full support. 
But there is a, a, a but. Uh, if this second term is larger than the, sec the first, then the rate that you get is different. And, uh, but imagine, but think about, so this second term is larger if delta, so if the, the, the width of your tube is very, very small. So for the moment, assume that the width is not too small. So if the width is not too small, what you get is the linear anisotropy. So you know that the rate you obtain for delta not too small is minimax. So you get the best possible rate. Our procedure, and it's, I mean, our, it's not our because the Richard process mixture of normals, it's everybody's, huh? everybody's using them. So this, it, it's totally adaptive. It's adaptive to M, it's adaptive to delta, and it's adaptive to beta. So none of these quantities enter in the construction of your prior. And even little d doesn't enter. Uh, I haven't described this sort of second version, which is a hybrid version. Uh, for me, this is probably the best uh, because it's going to be even more flexible, but not too flexible, except that it's harder to compute. And so we haven't uh, implemented it, but it's, I think it's probably the best one. So why is it working so well? Uh, I think so well, in my opinion. Um, essentially, when you want to prove this sort of rate that you're not going to see the proof, uh, don't be frightened. But to, uh, the idea is that you have to find a mixture of normals uh, to approximate F0. So you want to construct a, a, a mixture which is going to be a good approximation on F0. And so to, to do that, uh, uh, before constructing a discrete mixture, you're going to construct a continuous mixture. And the continuous mixture, mixture is this one. So it's a, it's a it's not exactly a mixture here because the sigma of mu depends on mu here. So this object doesn't really integrate to one. Um, but uh, so it's just a theoretical object. And what you're going to prove is that if you choose well, so you, and this, uh, this sigma of mu, and this is a purely con theoretical construction, this sigma of mu is constructed using as an orientation for your covariance matrix. You're going to, uh, to use uh, the projection along the tangent space at mu and the projection along the uh, normal space at, at mu. So these are in a sort of a rotation along these axis. And you rotate, and then you take this lambda, which is going to, uh, going to zero at a certain rate, according to each of these axes. And uh, that, allows, that allows you to prove that for sigma going to zero, k sigma of f is going to, to be close to f, and is going to be actually very close in a sense. You can construct an f1 such so that k sigma of f1 equals f0 plus sigma to the power of beta. And then you do the usual story, blah, 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 and you get the posterior contraction rates. So this is the theoretical results. Now in practice, how does it work? So we implemented the partially, partially location scale mixture with the Dirichlet process on P here from you and on uh, with some base measure, which are what they are. And uh, lambda j's are inverse, inverse gamma. So the theory told us that it should be square root of lambda j that are inverse gamma. But we did lambda j because it's there easier to, to implement. And now, uh, and because of that, the choice of the BJs are going to be important. So either you fix them, small or not small, or you put a prior on them. And what's amazing is actually putting a prior on them sort of does the job. Uh, so here is a very simple example. So the blue, do the blue points are observations. So they are observations near the manifold. So the delta here is, about, I think, is 0 0.01. So the manifold is a, is a parabola, is a, a, a par portion of the parabola. And the data are the blue points. And what we did is we, we ran the al algorithm. And we simulated data using the posterior mean of our algorithm. So we, we computed the f hat. And then we simulated data, new data from this f hat. And the new data are the red, red points. So what you, what you can see is that in this plot and, plot and that one, you can recover very well the support of your prior. It's, we didn't check whether the density were closed, but at least the support is well recovered. Here, if you choose BG is too large, be the BJ is too large, then it's terrible. And if you use uh, the usual one, so the sort of the conjugate version that people use in practice uh, for the location uh, mixture or location scale mixture, it doesn't work at all. That's the one, that's, that, that's that one. That's another example with a slightly more complicated manifold, but more interestingly, um, so of course, these examples, we use Gibbs sampler, so you can run a Gibbs sampler. Uh, it's quite uh, computationally uh, intensive. It's not, as soon as capital D starts increasing, it, it starts becoming more and more expensive. And uh, what we did instead is we computed the map uh, because there are like, um, 
uh, packages that allowed us to do that very easily. So we computed the map and, uh, and that's very fast. And uh, so this is the same plot. So here you essentially have 300 observations and delta is around 0 0.1 there and delta is 0 0.01 here. And, uh, and, and this is uh, the second example here, this one, it's an example where the reach is not uh, is, is zero, but it's, it's zero because you have a bottleneck. But it's, and as, as I was explaining you, it's not a problem for the theory. So the theory accepts that and, it's, and in practice, it works well as well. So, they're, they're, that, so these are the true observations and they are, these are reconstructed observations from an estimator based on our procedure. More interestingly, capital D equals three. So here you have a thousand, the first, you have a thousand observations and there you have 10,000 observations. And at least, I, I mean, it looks super good. I don't know whether this, the, the densities are actually close, but uh, the, at least we recover the, the, the support of the densities very well uh, in this context. So before I, to, before I, I, I leave the floor to, uh, to Paul, just uh, some comments on what this first part of the work. Uh, I mean, there are open questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, is to construct scalable algorithms. So there was this map, but the map only gives you a point estimator. It doesn't give you a, um, <clears throat> it doesn't give you a, 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 a whole distribution. How to imp compute uh, the to implement the hybrid version again is uh, uh, well I haven't described it so you have no idea but um, uh, it's going to be even more complicated and so maybe using variational Bayes would be the way to go I don't know um, another thing is that we had this uh, delta so the, this rates that had the uh, uh, the minimax version uh, or if delta was too small a rate that was not minimax. Um, and oh, it's not clear whether it's minimax or not because there is no minimax theory for this part. Um, we used to think that maybe uh, there was a catch and the fact that if delta was too small, it would degrade the rates. But uh, recently with some sort of uh, new computation that we've done, actually we think now that uh, we can get the, 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 the same rate even with delta small. Uh, it's, so that would be a, a nice uh, sort of uh, first step towards getting delta equal zero. Uh, which is another story. But delta is equal zero is something that Paul is going to talk about. Uh, now, here it's all rates of convergence in terms of the L1 norm. And is the L1 norm because we have densities on Rd. But if you're assuming that your observations are on the manifold, then the L1 norm doesn't really make any sense anymore. So what you want is a, is a, is a metric that sort of makes sense and that takes, takes into account the geometry of your space in a sense. And the sort of the most natural one is the Wasserstein uh, distance. And so this is what uh, Paul is going to talk about. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to. May I ask a question or is, would you like to wait? Um, what time is it? Um, it? You're exactly 30 minutes in. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, so maybe uh, we can have like uh, uh, a few minutes of questions, and then we can uh, leave the floor to uh, Paul. Uh, thank you, Judith. Uh, that was a lovely presentation. Uh, in your convergence rates, you assume that the dimension of the manifold D was constant, but yeah. the manifold can have differing dimensions uh, mm -hmm. depending on where you are on it. Have you any thoughts about that? Yeah. So this is yeah, it's a very good point, and so that's where I think the hybrid version is going to. I mean, we have no theory. And it's, it's going to be very hard to give a theory, and I'm going to explain why afterwards. But I'm going to, to like in practice, I would go for the hybrid version. And so the if like because I have a few more minutes, so the hybrid uh, algorithm um, is is this one, and so it's a location scale mixture. But uh, the the so you have a Dirichlet process location scale mixture here. So you're mixing over mu o and lambda, but you're going to be a bit clever in the construction of your Dirichlet process. So conditionally on some Q, okay, the base measure of your Dirichlet process is going to be a G naught for mu and O. So this is like, and it's going to be the, like the usual, the one that the same as before, and a Q to the power D for the lambda, so for the for the uh, eigenvalues of your sigma, of your covariance matrix, okay, and Q is going to be itself a Dirichlet process. And so the reason why you want to do that is because when when we when you prove so it, maybe it's only theoretically true but 
given how the location scale mixture don't work so well in our context, I think that there is more than just theory. I think in practice also, it's, a, it's not so good, the, the, the pure location scale mixture. So the reason why the, you want to do something like that is that when you make, when you try to understand why a, a, a mixture approximates a smooth function, essentially what you do is you, you consider this, uh, your mixture here, you're forcing sigma for every component, you're forcing sigma to go to zero. Okay. Okay. And so having a lot of components with very small variance. And that's not good because it, the prior mass of this object is going to be very small. And so, and so what you, what, what you want to do is you want to share information. You want to say, okay, some sigmas are going to be the same for some of the components and they are going to have a small variance and others are going to be a bit different, but they are there. And I, and I can, and to be able to share that, you have to put a, a discrete prior on the base measure for sigma for the lambda, for the eigenvalues. And by doing that, I think what, what you're going to be doing is that you, for some parts of, for some of the components, you're going to have some of the lambdas that corresponds to the dimension details. And some of the, of the lambdas that, uh, at other parts, you can pick up a different D because you are allowing lambda to vary spatially. But to prove that with the mixtures, it's very hard because uh, here you're going, it, it implies that the, the global rates is going to be different from the local rates, uh, depending on where you are. And that's something that's very, uh, that's very hard to prove with, with mixtures because they are two complex objects. Would the average dimension of the manifold be a relevant uh, characteristic in trying to get a result? No, I think what's going to be uh, to happen if you wanted to prove something like that is going to be the rate is going to be impacted by the worst case. I see, thank you. But because it's going to be a global rate, but then if you were able to prove it, my my uh, gut feeling is that is that actually probably what's going to happen is that locally you get a, a rate that's going to be impacted by the local dimension. Uh, if the dimension is evolving smoothly, like piecewise constant or something like that. Yes. Thank you very much. Is there any other questions, or shall I? Uh, give the slides to Hi everyone, so glad to talk here today. Um, yeah, so I'm taking over for the second part of the talk, which is in a sense taking delta equal to zero to what we've done before, but by, with the Wasserstein metric, uh, and topology instead of the L1 distance. Uh, and not really about like the priors we just presented, but mixture models in general and also discrete priors like directly and with many processes. Okay, so first of all, um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about Wasserstein topology and its relationship with the weak topology in general, because that's relevant. So, um, so yeah, the Wasserstein distance, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of the definition, I'm just uh, recording it real quick. So um, you're in a space, like typically X here is equal to RD. Uh, P is like just an index bigger than one. And in this, this, you define a distance between probability measures mu and u, which are arbitrary. You don't need to have densities to talk about the Wasserstein distance. And define this kind of quantities that are uh, defined as infimums. Uh, so here, WP. Um, <clears throat> that are defined as an infimum over all coupling, which is just, uh, so here with gamma is just the set of couplings of mu and mu, which are the sets of probability distribution on the, um, the product space uh, RD times RD that have marginals equal to mu and mu. Uh, and then you get the infimum of all of these quantities and you take the power one over P. So we're not, we're, we're not gonna go into details about what it's, uh, what it's, what it means today, but yeah, that's kind of the idea for defining the uh, Wasserstein distance. And what's important is that uh, it's always a distance, uh, distance on a subset of the probability measures P of X. So the subset here, uh, which is relevant is P, P of X, which is basically the measures that have a P moment, a finite P moment. And if X is bounded, uh, typically in zero one to the power d, then it is a distance of p of x because of course every probability you just have finite moments of all orders. Okay, um, and more importantly, if you have a compact space, uh, in fact, 
the convergence in the sense of Russell chain metric is the same as the convergence in the weak topology. That is to say, mu k uh, converges towards mu uh, in distribution is the same to say that WP of mu k and mu and mu goes to zero. Um, but in general, uh, if your space is not compact, that's not long, that's no longer true. You have to uh, basically assume the convergence of the pth moment uh, in addition to the weak convergence. And in general, you can also describe the topology uh, in terms of neighborhoods of every point uh, in the Wasserstein space, PP of X, uh, with respect to the Wasserstein topology, which is just the, the topology that's uh, that is defined by the Wasserstein distances. And this is, uh, it looks exactly the same as the weak topology, that is to say it's defined using continuous and bounded functions. But um, here it's not continuous and bounded, it's continuous and uh, have uh, it's all of the functions that have polynomial growth of other order uh, no, no more than P actually. Okay. So if P equal to zero, you recover at least formally this, uh, the definition of the weak convergence. Okay, so the Wasserstein distances here are relevant because, of course, we are interested in describing weak convergence of quality measures because when you don't know the support or when the support is completely degenerated with respect to the Lebesgue measure, you cannot expect to have like strong convergences like LP in terms of LP distances between the density or things like this. Okay. <clears throat> so first of all, we are going to uh, think about a situation in which um, uh, we can think about a simple Bayesian prior uh, that can lead to this kind of uh, dimension, uh, nice dimension reduction properties um, in terms of contraction rates. Um, and for this, the easiest kind of Bayesian priors that we can think about is the Dirichlet process prior or uh, its associated extension, the big manual process. Um, so yeah. So what we're going to do uh, now is just make a low dimensionality assumption. So it kind of generalizes the manifold hypothesis when you assume that your data lives exactly on a sub-manifold of dimensions strictly less than the, the ambient space's dimension. Um, but here, it's kind of the same idea, but we are just asking for um, uh, the support of your true data generating distribution mu not here in this model uh, to be uh, to have a low metric entropy, which is to say like you take these supports and you ask for the covering number uh, of this support to be less than epsilon to the minus s, where s is strictly less than d, and uh, epsilon is the, the scale of your covering number. Okay. Uh, and so in, in particular, if you assume that the support of mu is exactly, or is, is contained in a sub-manifold of dimension s, then you satisfy this assumption. Okay. Um, yeah, so as I said, we want to think of a Bayesian prior that can take advantage of this situation. Uh, so previously we saw that some kind of directly process mixture of normals with good priors on the mixing and the mixing measure can lead to good contraction properties. But here we want to just study something simpler and, um, and that can lead to good contraction properties in the weak topology when you are exactly on the sub manifold and not just around it. Okay. So what we know so far, uh, at least in a frequency setting, is that um, you have good, proper good co convergence properties in terms of the vast chain distance uh, for the empirical measure associated to an ID sample from the limit. Okay. Uh, so that's what we have recorded just here. And uh, yeah, so if you look at the average uh, Wasserstein distance between your empirical measure and mu nodes, then know that this is only impacted in a way by uh, at the dimensionality s of your support of the support of your measure, your data generating measure. Okay, um, and we also know that this is essentially optimal, at least when the support is regular enough. But yeah, that, that's kind of the subtleties of the theory. Um, so since we know that the, the directly process prior is really closely linked to the empirical measure, we just, yeah, it's natural to think or at least to ask uh, what are the contraction properties of the directly process uh, prior in terms of the Wasserstein distance. 
um, yeah, so that's what you are going to, going to do. But first, um, there is a result uh, of a non-parametric uh, Bernstein von Wiesen's theorem, so BVM theorem, for the pit manure process. Um, that is uh, that kind of uh, leads you to think that you cannot expect such good contraction properties uh, in all generality for the pit manure uh, process. So why is that? It's because basically in your BVM theorem, you have a centering that is kind of known to be inconsistent with respect to the weak topology. And uh, this is inconsistency just almost implies, uh, implies that uh, you cannot hope for this kind of nice properties from the pit manure process. So yeah, we are just gonna look at the directly process in this talk. Um, yeah, and the same result, the same BVM theorem by the way, implies uh, optimal contraction rate for the directly process, at least in W1 but you cannot really extend the proof to WP, uh, at least using the BVM theorem. So yeah, we, we just want a more direct proof for uh, the contraction properties of the directly process in the best of time study. So for this, we are gonna use a tool that is, has been used actually in, the, um, uh, in order to prove this fact. Uh, so the convergence of the empirical measure. Uh, and this is something called the dyadic partitioning argument, which is just to say that uh, you have a nice upper bound on Wasserstein instance by something that you can actually uh, study more efficiently. Um, so what you do is you, so let's assume that you are in zero one to the power of Z, okay? This is your data space. Um, and what you do is you define a sequence of nested partitions of uh, zero one to the D uh, just by the edit partition. So you, you cut into half uh, each axis at each step and you define these nested partitions. So you're kind of filtering your space like this. And then you make, uh, so you take mu and mu, you want to give an upper bound on the pith power of the Wasserstein distance between mu and mu. And what you do is you can, you compute a weighted sum of the differences between the probability assigned by mu and mu on the element of your partition. And so you take the weighted sum and actually uh, by theorem, this is an upper bound on the Wasserstein distance. And of course, since the direct process has explicit posterior marginals, then you can work directly on this upper bound and try to, power, to prove uh, contraction rights, uh, contraction properties uh, a posteriori directly, because you know the, yeah, you know the, the, the posterior marginals of your mu, q, g, k in this case, if mu uh, follows the posterior associated with your direct process. And what you get is this. So <clears throat> if you look at, uh, sorry, maybe I'm just going down for a bit. Yeah, let's take the, the case where alpha is strictly, uh, is bigger than zero. Then you know that the directly process, so with base measure alpha p naught, has a posterior given by another directly process with base measure, uh, base measure uh, alpha p naught plus uh, npn, where pn is again the empirical measure. And uh, yeah, so saying this actually is just uh, a result of contraction rates uh, for the directly process posterior with respect to the with respect to the Wasserstein metric, okay? And if alpha is equal to zero, then these terms disappear and you just left with the Bayesian bootstrap BP of NPN. So this kind of unifies the two in some sense. And what you get is a rate that is extremely similar to the frequencies rate of the convergence of the empirical measure towards the, the true data generating distribution. But of course, this is a really specific proof because you using you're crucially using the, the explicit uh, posterior marginals beyond direct process. So yeah, there is no way you can extend this beyond the direct process. Uh, yeah, but it's, it's still nice because you have um, a discrete Bayesian prior that is really simple, and yeah, in the worst case, you can always use it and it can automatically adapt to the intrinsic dimensionality of your data. But yeah, of course it cannot adapt to the smoothness of uh, your data generating distribution because it is discrete. Okay, so now we want to go beyond discrete 
uh, discrete priors, and we are again going to talk about mixture models. Uh, so why should it give us uh, better properties? Uh, in some sense, it's not clear because when you have uh, data that live exactly on the same manifold, then you cannot really speak about smoothness of the density because you do not have a density with respect to the Lebesgue measure. But if you make the assumption that you have a density with respect to uh, what replace, what's replacing the Lebesgue measure on the manifold, so as Judith said, is the Hausdorff measure restricted to the manifold. Uh, so if you assume that your data generosity distribution mu node has a density mu node with respect to the host of measure on your manifold, then in a way you can make smoothness assumption on your density on your manifold, not on the full space. And you can expect that some prior may lead to better contraction properties. So we're going to take a dominated model with a mixture, uh, a directly processed mixture again of normals, but we are targeting a not dominated new node. So we have to adopt, adapt all of the approaches in the NP to prove contraction properties, um, because they crucially rely, usually rely on uh, domination by the same uh, measure between your model and your target. So first of all, we are going to make uh, the manifold hypothesis assumption. So you have new nodes your data generating distribution that uh, assigns all of its mass to your manifold. And then you make a compactness assumption on M just for simplicity. And you also assume that it's C3 smooth, which is a technical assumption to have yeah, a development of your, um, basically your local parametrization map of your manifold like just technical. So your manifold is loose enough, basically. Um, so that's your assumption on your manifold. And then you have an assumption on your node, uh, your node that is, um, it has a density F node with respect to the normalized Hausdorff measure on M. So normalized is just to say that you take the uniform measure on M, basically. And you assume also that F node is uh, beta older with beta less than one. So what does it mean? It means that seen through charts, uh, so parametrization of your manifold, you are beta older uh, on, uh, yeah, on your tangent spaces, basically. Um, another definition would be that uh, your um, so density of node can be extended to a true function on uh, the full space RD that is still beta older. Okay. Uh, and then you assume also that you're, um, that you're lower bounded by some uh, constant f min. Uh, f not is everywhere greater than f. Then you consider a really simple uh, directly processed mixture model uh, with a deterministic variance. So you're not in, uh, putting a prior on your variance and, um, and a directly processed uh, prior on your mixing measure. Okay. And then what happens is that a posteriori, your, uh, your posterior density will be really concentrated around M. And then uh, since it's really concent concentrated, as we said, it will have exposing values. Okay, So F will not be of the same order of magnitude as, uh, as F not on the manifold, which is normalized, and F is not normalized on the manifold, but just on RD. Okay. So in a way, in order to study theoretically your, this object, you need to renormalize by something. And yeah, the, the most obvious thing would be to renormalize by the normalization on your M, your manifold. But in fact, you can also renormalize by something that's explicit that I wrote as gamma N here. But yeah, let's just say that you're renormalized by uh, true renormalization constant on your manifold here that you cannot compute because you don't know the manifold, but it exists at least theoretically. Okay. Then your posterior measure uh, on F. Is still written by base rule, okay? Because you have a dominating model. F is, yeah, uh, since you have a dominating model, you can write this as your posterior measure on F. And then in order to study the contraction property, uh, what you do usually is that you divide both the numerator and the denominator by uh, basically your true density. But since here the two objects are not comparable in a way, you, need to, you cannot really do that. And what you do is that you introduce the, the unknown normalization constant C of F. Okay? But what you pay is that you have C of F to, to the power N uh, on the right, which kind of kills you uh, farther away in the proof, because as we said, C of F can explode and must explode uh, a posterior. Okay? 
And so uh, building from this, so our co-author, uh, Clement Berenfeld, showed that this, this contraction rate results in terms of the L1 distance on the manifold, uh, that is to say the L1 distance with respect to UM. Okay. Um, but the problem with this kind of result is that it's really hard to interpret statistically because you do not have access to the estimator f over COF. So first, because you do not know COF, but also because this is a uh, convergence with respect to uh, the topology L1 of mu m. So you do not really know where to look to observe this convergence because you do not know which uh, what is your manifold. Okay, so it's a nice uh, result theoretically, but in practice, it's not really useful. Okay. Um, and in fact, what we can do is to study weak consistency, uh, or at least weak convergence of your posterior toward the true data generating distribution. So you're considering not, a, not the topology L1 of mu m here, but the topology, the weak topology on the probability distribution on R. Okay. And in fact, we can prove uh, weak consistency of uh, this kind of uh, uh, direct, uh, for this kind of directly process mixture uh, priors uh, by adapting standard proof techniques, but we have this problem of normalization constants. Okay. Um, yeah. So the proof involved like the the fine control of the unknown normalization constant because it's something that you need to care about in the computations. But you also have to, to show that a posteriori you have this bias that is uh, like, yeah, if you, if you want to show weak consistency of your, uh, of your Bayesian posterior, you take a, a weak neighborhood that you can always assume to be of this form. It is you have to, to show that uh, uh, you have to show that uh, a posteriori the, the expectation of each continuous and bounded functions uh, is close to the expectation of this continuous and bounded function with respect to the, your unknown data generating distribution. And the fact is, um, since you are living on RD and not the manifold, you have kind of a bias. That is to say, you have to show that a posteriori, so psi is your continuous and bounded function, you have to show that the integral of over the full space RD of psi uh, with respect to f, which is the output of your posterior, is close to the expectation of psi with respect to the normalized restriction of f over your manifold. So f times the Hausdorff measure divided by the normalization constant. So in a way, in order to prove this, you have to show that um, your mixing measure p is a posteriori concentrated around your sub manifold. But yeah, it's not really direct. Um, yeah, that's crucially what makes the proof work. So yeah, um, in order to show this, you have to work a posteriori. You cannot just rely on um, assumptions on your prior to show this by standard proof technique. It's an extra step. Um, we are able to extend this result to Wasserstein consistency really easily because actually the, the manifold is supposed to be compact. And you can show quite easily that uh, you have an, uh, a characterization of Wasserstein consistency in terms of weak consistency plus something, the something being, in some sense, the p uniform integrability of your posterior. Uh, yeah, yeah in, uh, p, you have to assume a p uniformly integrable kind of condition on your posterior, but we can go back to this afterwards. And using the compactness of M, we can actually prove that um, um, yeah, in our setting, so DPN plus manifold, we can prove that we have consistency with respect to the Wasserstein topology for every P. Okay. But the crucial, the crucial point uh, in the proof was to prove consistency, weak consistency, not Wasserstein consistency. Um, this is this kind of result uh, that, that is to say Wasserstein consistency is equivalent to weak consistency plus something is something that has been known uh, previously in dominated settings. Uh, especially by this uh, in this paper by uh, Che uh, et al. Um, yeah, so basically, if you assume that you are a KL condition, this is uh, a standard assumption to have uh, to, to put on your prior um, in order to verify uh, weak consistency. 
and uh, that you have uh, uniform boundedness of uh, the p plus delta moment of your posterior uh, your posterior density, then you are doubly p consistent at p. And this is really closely linked to the result we just talked about before. And again, I can uh, apply that result to a kind of directly processing sure of normals on the real line this time. That's kind of the same idea, except that in this case, they have a restriction of the uh, index P because they are truly non compact. Because firstly, first, they don't have a manifold assumption. And also, they are assuming like real tails for the, their densities. So that's why there is like a restriction. Um, again, their proof rely on the geodic partitioning argument that we have used for the diagnosis before. Um, yeah. And they can extend also their theory to um, posterior contraction with respect to the Wasserstein distance. Um, but they are still limited by uh, the KL, uh, like the, can, the thing that you can call the non parametric rate, that is the the rate that you would have in the Hellinger distance or the L1 distance, because we are using standard proof techniques that rely on testing approaches, basically. Uh, so it's slightly suboptimal when you look at it from uh, with the Wasserstein metric. Uh, so yeah, you, you're paying an extra an extra cost, but yeah, it's not dramatic, but it's slightly suboptimal. Um, and yeah, we may be able to extend this result in our setting, basically. Also, uh, something that's uh, kind of nice to, uh, uh, to mention. So uh, going back to this kind of BVM theorems uh, uh, arguments in order to prove assertion consistency or contraction rates, um, you, you, can use, uh, you can use BVM theorems in order to prove uh, assertion contraction, at least in one setting. Um, so let's say that uh, you're on zero one and you want to estimate the density on zero one, you just make the assumption that it's lower bounded and older for some beta, uh, so beta older for some beta less than one. Then in this case, in fact, uh, you can control the Wasserstein distance between an over density and your true density uh, by uh, a dual Bezos norm. So what's the dual Bezos norm? It's uh, the norm on the dual space of a Bezos space, which is just a functional space. And as a dual space, it's compatible with kind of weak convergence properties. So it's natural to compare the social to something like this. Uh, so you can kind of prove this, this other bound. And what we have in this setting, so it's a, a, B, a BVM theorem proved by Castillo and Nickel in 2014, I think, um, for uh, a prior that is a Dirichlet histogram prior. So you just put a, a random histogram with directly prior on the weight, and you put a deterministic scaling uh, parameter, so that if you say that you choose non-adaptively the number of bins for your histogram, but you put a random directly prior on, uh, on the weights of your histogram. And in this case, they have a result that is a BVM that is strong enough to control this upper bound on the, that's, that's involving the dual base of time. And uh, we are able to extend, uh, to prove uh, an optimal WP contraction right in this setting. So that's really nice, but we don't, we don't really know if it's uh, an argument that's super strong to, to control Wasserstein or, or if that's something that you really need to do in some, in some sense when you go, we go beyond uh, simple cases like the dual uh, Yeah, so in, in general, we, we think that's the case. We think that in order to prove at least optimal, of course, optimal contraction rates for the, uh, in respect to the Wasserstein distances, we may have to prove something that looks like BVM, uh, I mean, we're not sure yet, but that's just intuition. Um, yeah, and, and also comparing the Wasserstein distance with a dual functional norm appears to be crucial because yeah, that's, some, that's uh, an idea that has also been used in a frequency setting for this, even in a manifold, um, a manifold hypothesis kind of setting uh, where you look at the dual base of norm for the base of space, not on RD, but on the sun manifold. So that's even harder, but yeah. So uh, yeah, uh, we think that proving optimal WP contraction rate basically is really challenging so, yeah, because it uses kind of BVM arguments. Okay, I think I'm done. So thanks, and if you have any questions. Yeah, so thanks, uh, thanks for your talk.
that was uh, very interesting. So, so does anyone anyone have any questions either for Paul or Judith? So, so I, I had one question, maybe to get things started. So that was for Judith. So you have this this hybrid setup, and yeah. and you have this uh, two level Dirichlet process prior for Lambda. So, so is there any hope for having continuous priors, heavy prior, heavy tail priors, or something hierarchical priors for Lambda to avoid having this kind of double Dirichlet process setup? Um, I wouldn't go there. Uh, so, so at least as far as theory is concerned, so so the constraint that you have on lambda is that uh, you have to be very careful on how uh, you accept lambdas that are close to zero, in a sense. And so, so somehow what happens on the tails for lambda large is not so important, except that actually for the hybrid you have. Uh, we are not so it's harder to, to prove things and so we have stronger assumptions on the tails but um but really the, the crucial part is that near the, the behavior of your of your base measure near zero yes that's how the behavior of your q near zero is that i mean does it answer i'm not sure answering your question but is that what you were asking um kind of uh, well, I guess I guess my, my question is, is, I mean, in a way, computationally, it'd be easier if you had a continuous prior there, even if it was kind of hierarchical. Uh, um, uh, and and so I guess the question, the question really is whether there's whether you could imagine, is it just that it's completely hopeless to try and imagine building a continuous prior there, or is there some clever thing you might uh, be able to do? I don't know. I, I don't know. So really, the reason why we went for the Dirichlet process is because we were, we had this idea of it's, it's sort of it's sharing your your you're sharing the values for lambdas, and with a with a continuous version you're not doing that. But maybe somehow because if it's smooth, uh, you, you get something like that. But um, uh, yeah, maybe you can try it in practice and see, like in the sort of examples that we had we, we have. If you try something like that and to see whether it it allows you to shrink enough, like because so what we tried is a basic. Uh, um, like conjugate Dirichlet process location scale with Dirichlet process mixture of, of normals. Where for the base measure uh, on on sigma you have an inverse Richard, uh, and uh, it doesn't capture at all this concentration phenomena. Uh, it, it it captures a bit, but not not strongly enough. So it's really definitely suboptimal. But yeah, so, but I mean, I guess that's for the one for the one might do that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of my question, I guess, that you can kind of have these continuous priors and things, and often they kind of, they can work kind of similar to discrete priors, but at some point they, they don't quite do the same thing. So yeah. so I guess that's my kind of intuition, whether it's, whether you're on the right side or the wrong side, kind of. But anyway, obviously you don't know, but uh, yeah. yeah, that was kind of uh, my, my query. Uh, so there was a question uh, by Long, but it seems to be in a different language. <laughs> I don't know. Or, or was it a joke? Or... Anyone able to translate? I think it was to say hello to someone because you, it was right at the beginning before you start. Ah, okay, okay, okay. So I'm not sure, but uh, I know. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. It must be right. But I actually I have a small question if uh, there's time. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Um, sure. Yeah, I was wondering about your your beta at the beginning, your smoothness uh, assumption. Is it uh, uh, is it um, possible to assume that your beta zero are uh, the differ the differs beta are different? You you assume them to be equal to beta zero, but I guess uh, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure it may, like as far as our, because uh, in the, in the prior the, we ha we are assuming that all the lambda j's on the diagonals are different. And mm. so I think the, the theory should go through with different beta not. Huh? Uh, we discussed that with Paul and Clema, but it's just that it was already super technical. Huh? And mm. so we, we tried to make our life a little easier yeah. by doing this beta not and beta per. But definitely you could imagine a diff different beta chase. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we tried to do it with like completely a completely random, like generic regularity vector, but Okay. Yeah, it becomes uh, quickly like a nightmare in terms. It's just like very technical. Okay. But I, I would, I, my my intuition is that it works. Okay, I, I have a second smaller question. So, um, 
at some point you you need a, a mixing distribution on your orthogonal uh, matrices and so i was wondering uh, what do you take in practice uh, for such a distribution uh so in the in the partial location uh, location partially location scale mixture you have like a mixing mixture on uh, the tuples mu and o so for for each location mu you have an associated o and for the base measure of, uh, of this you take like I don't know, like a caution on mu i think that's what we took yeah. and uh, so uh, the base measure is like the, the tensor product of uh, an exponential on mu and a uniform R measure on the orthogonal group. Okay. Oh, yeah, you take a uniform. Okay. Yeah, you, you could take something else, but it's just computationally yeah, convenient. So it works. Yeah, so the, the advantage of doing that is uh, because um, the post, then you can have a Gibbs sampler because of the, the columns of OJ. So the, if you put OJ the columns of O, you can uh, update the, do you have an explicit formula for the conditional distribution of OJ given everything else and the latent variables? Mm. And so you have a rather nice deep sampler there. It's still very slow, but it's rather nice. Okay. So you mean conditionally on on, on the other columns and mu? Or just yeah, on on conditionally on the other columns, mu, the allocation variable. So you use the deep sampler, so you have the allocations for the observations. The, allo the allocation for the observations, you have a, a, an explicit distribution for these co columns of O. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. It's also why it makes it slow when capital D increases because mm -hmm. uh, for each iteration you have to go through all these columns. Mm -hmm. the, the dimensionality of your orthogonal group is like D squared. So yeah, even for D, D equals to three, it was kind of horrible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there are, there are, I don't remember the name, there is a distribution for orthogonal matrices, but... Um... Yeah, it's, it's one of those. I mean, there are a few, but uh, so we use this uh, mm -hmm. family of distributions. Yeah, in fact, like the, the prior distribution is uniform, or more generally, we can take like something called the von Mies Fisher thing, it kind of generalizes the Fisher distribution on the circle. Uh, and then a posteriori, you do not have like uh, something that belongs to this family, but something called the Bingham von Mies Fisher. Yeah, the Bingham, yeah, that's what the one. Yeah, is. so that's exactly the one that appears a posteriori when you condition. When you, Program your GP sampler actually. Ah, okay. Mm. Mm. Thanks. Are there other other questions? Okay, so I guess uh, we'll call things a day. So thanks to Judith and Paul again. A very interesting talk, and uh, we'll see everyone again hopefully next uh, next month for our next talk. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye.